Family Theater presents Tom Drake and Dan O'Hurley. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Design Flaw, starring Tom Drake. And now, here is your host, Dan O'Herlihy. Thank you, Tony Lofrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together, as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Design Flaw, starring Tom Drake as Mike. <laughs> Get it out of the dive. The plane can't take it. That's foolishness. Everything's going to be all right. You're wrong, I tell you. The plane can't take it. We're going to crash. Nothing at all to worry about. Greatest aircraft ever designed. You've got to listen to me before it's too late. We're going to crash. There's something wrong with this plane. Something wrong with the Humboldt 7? <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. Then what's the matter with it? Can you tell me that? No, no, I can't, but you've got to listen to me. You can't tell me, but you say I should listen to you. It's not airworthy. Not airworthy? Flies like a dream. Look at that airspeed. That's because we're in a dive, man. Bolton, you're a good engineer, but leave the overall picture to us. We know what we're doing. You don't. The plane will crash. <laughs> That's nonsense. Think of the people who will be killed. <laughs> oh, oh, I told you. I told you. Why wouldn't you listen to me? Oh, why wouldn't you listen? Mike. Mike, stop it. Stop it. Now look what's happened. Look. Mike. Huh? Oh. oh. Mike, I'm sorry, but you told me to hit you. Mike. Are you all right now? Oh, Ann. I'm sorry, but you told me to slap you if it ever happened again. Oh. That's all right. Thanks. Same dream? Yeah, yeah, same one. What time is it? Um, 4.30. Ooh, 4.30? It's beginning to get light outside. Oh, well... You getting up? I might as well. Getting up in a couple hours anyway. I just don't feel like going back to sleep. Uh, I might as well get up with you. Uh, now you go on back to sleep. Uh, make some coffee and keep you company. I can always take a nap when Eddie takes his... Will you, though? <laughs> I will. Mm, hand me my robe. Yeah. Mm. Oh, oh, wait. Hmm? I just want to look in on the baby. Is he all right? Fine. Hey. <laughs> look, he's sucking his thumb. <laughs> Almost three, and he's still at it. It's a little discouraging, all right. What does it the book say about it? Uh, that they do it either because they're hungry or they aren't getting enough love. Mm. <laughs> Baby books. Yeah. You know, I think it's because he's too old to nurse and too young for chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> sure wish you'd quit it. Mm. Turn on the light, will you? Yeah. Oh, did you uh, set the coffee pot up? Mm -hmm. All I have to do is plug it in. That's it. Now all you have to do is wait. You know, maybe if we put something that tastes bad on his thumb, he'd quit. No, no. One frustrated male in the family is enough. Hmm. Yeah, maybe you're right. Mike. Hmm? Why don't you tell me about your dream? Oh, well, it's just about work. So? Remember when we first married, I said I wouldn't bring troubles home from the office? Well, it might help to talk about it. No, oh, it's nothing much, really. All right, so don't tell me. I'm just the girl who wakes you up, remember? Come on, what's the dream? Well... Does it 
have something to do with that special project they put you on? Yeah. Mm. I'm not supposed to talk about it. But I, I, I guess I can't do any harm now. You see, honey, Humboldt is building, or has built, I should say, the biggest aircraft that's ever been built. That's the project, huh? And that's it. Mm. I can't give you too many particulars, all classified information. You know the deal. Well, I don't want any of the particulars. I just want to know what worries you about it. What do you, what do you dream about when you have those nightmares? What do I dream about? Mm -hmm. Well, I dream I'm up in the seven. Yeah, that's what we call it, Humboldt Seven. And I dream I'm up in it. Sometimes with Courier, sometimes with Packard, sometimes with Humboldt himself. And we're running a test. But for some reason, the plane is full, crowded with seats like a non scat and every seat full. Go on. And then suddenly the plane goes into a shallow dive. And when I tell whoever's flying, well, when I tell them what's happening, well, they won't believe me. And the plane keeps going down and down, and suddenly it crashes. I don't know why, but I'm always the only survivor, standing in the middle of the desert with wreckage and, oh, and bodies as far as the eye can see. Oh. Well, that's uh, quite a dream. Yes, and I know why I have it. Why do you? I don't think she's airworthy. <laughs> and I don't know why I feel that way. I've been over the blueprint books 50 times. I've studied every part that's in her, even the instruments. And I still can't find anything wrong. But you don't think the plane's airworthy? Well, I'm sure she isn't. Well, how do the other engineers feel about it? Well, I think Al Marcus feels the way I do, but the rest have... Well, I have nothing but confidence. Hmm. Have you um, considered the idea that you might be wrong? Well, that's all I keep telling myself, but it's no good. I've been working on the seven for less than a... Well, maybe a year. But I know her inside and out. When an engineer gets as familiar with a hunk of machinery as I am with the seven, well, well, it's almost like you are with Eddie. Eddie's your baby, and when something's wrong with him, well, you can almost sense it. Mm, I think I see what you mean now. There's something wrong with the plane. Yeah, but I can't put my finger on it. All I know is that, well, that she's a sick airplane. When did you first sense it, Mike? First sense it? Mm-hmm. Well, that's hard to say. Maybe from the first second I saw it. Maybe it's just a feeling that's been growing. But I certainly remember my first impression of the ship. I remember the day they sent me to the special shop they had her in. Her wings weren't on and her tail assembly wasn't completed. But still I was struck with the immensity of the thing. Take it since you got by the security guards that you're Mike Bolton. Hmm? Oh, oh yes. Tony Packard. How do you do? Big, isn't she? Yeah. Now that's an understatement. When she's finished, she'll be the biggest, heavier than aircraft that's ever been built. Or lighter than air, for that matter. Got a few feet on the Hindenburg. You will never get her off the ground. We'd better. You'll notice I said we. Then I'm assigned here permanently? Until completion, anyway. And when will that be? Shouldn't take more than eight months. We're pretty far along now. Come on, I'll show you through it. I suppose I'll be on power plants. That's what I've been doing for the last three years. And you'll probably be doing more of that than anything else. But I want every engineer to have as thorough a working knowledge of the whole ship as possible. Where are you... I mean, uh, where are we going to find runways to accommodate a plane like this? Right here. Runway 21 will be rebuilt just for the Humboldt 7. Humboldt 7? That's her official designation. Mm-hmm. All right. If, uh, if Runway 21 is being rebuilt, well, that's one field to accommodate her. Ah, she only needs one. What? This plane will be able to go anywhere in the world and return without either refueling or landing. Well, how? Come on, I'll show you around. <laughs> you think she's big from the outside? Wait till you see what the inside is like. I remembered once a long time ago as a Navy JG, I had a tour through the Mars, the flying boat that Hughes built. Well, you could have lost the Mars in this ship. But the Mars was an experiment. 
And aviation was serious about the Humboldt 7. And probably my first mistake on the project came about because I couldn't really get serious about it. Well, Bolton, what do you think of it? It's not a plane, it's, uh, it's an office building. Hmm? Huh? Just, uh, just how do you mean that? Well, I only mean that... Well, I never saw a structure that looked quite so much like it was meant to be part of the ground. <laughs> well, if it doesn't pan out, some counterman could certainly make a whale of a diner out of it. Uh, look, Bolton, before you say any more, maybe I'd better tell you something. The design of this ship is the work of about 800 engineers. But the basic design is mine. Mine and William Courier's. Well, I'm sorry. I certainly didn't That's mean... That's not important. But what is important? The money tied up now in that airplane amounts to more than half of what the company itself is worth. So it had better get off the ground. And it had better do everything it's designed to do. Now, wait a minute. You bring me in here and show me a leviathan like this? <laughs> well, how am I supposed to react? It's nothing to lose your temper about. Nothing to lose my temper about. I hadn't been told you were such a good engineer, you'd be looking for a job right now. All right, all right, I apologize. I'm sorry. But you'll have to admit, from an engineering standpoint, this plane looks like, well, nothing but trouble. Off on the wrong foot with the designer. That was my first mistake, but I was right. It was an engineering nightmare. There was more hydromatic equipment on the plane than Detroit puts out in a year. More moving parts than a Swiss watchmaker is likely to see in a lifetime. And pressurization. If they had the double bubble, the Globemaster, to get pressure, well, what problems would they have with this aircraft? And I use the term loosely. I'd rather have been given the job of pressurizing City Hall. Fortunately, though, well, that wasn't my problem. I had others, most of them dealing with power plants. I say it has to be steel. That's ridiculous. Look at this report. And this is on a Connie. Engine fire. Time of fire discovery by automatic equipment, 14 seconds. Time of beginning operation of fire control by automatic equipment, 20 seconds. Now get this. Loss of engine and supporting structure, 58 seconds. Now that means that the engine mounts were burned out and a section of the wing with it. That means that the I whole... I know perfectly well what it means. Well, if this clunk ever gets <laughs> CAA certification, which I doubt... There'll be as many as 300 lives, depending on the decisions we make here. Not we. I'll make the decisions. The spec calls for aluminum, and that's what it's going to be. We'll see about that. Just what do you mean by that? I am going to talk to Courier about it. And then if I have to, to Humboldt himself. Well, you do that, Bolton. You get the same answer you got from me. Oh, I don't know why I stay in this job. I swear I don't. I don't know either. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> hello, Marcus. I didn't see you. You and Packard have a little rhubarb? Oh, it's more than a little rhubarb, I'm afraid. You know, he doesn't like you much. I can't say that I blame him. I wouldn't like you either if you kept kicking my kid. The seven? Oh, he thinks it's about the best idea anybody ever had. What do you think? I think it's a mess. I don't like it, and I don't trust it. At least I'm not alone. Oh, yes, you are. You see, I'm not going to tell anybody how I feel about the plane. And you know why? Because it wouldn't do any good. Then you don't know why either. No. I don't think the plane will be airworthy, but I don't know why I don't think so. Eh? Well, it's not my money they're using, so I'll keep my opinion to myself. Do you think you should? Well, all I've got is a guesstimate. Who do you think will listen? Besides, if it isn't good, it won't get certified. Well, planes have been known to get certification even though there was something wrong. Something like this. That, well, that you can't see or measure. Yeah, well, I'm not going to risk the seniority I've got just because I feel there's something wrong. And if you do, you're crazy. Maybe so. But I think I'm right. Look, s suppose you are. And supposing even Humboldt feels the way you do about it. Unless there's a seeable, measurable failure in the ship, do you think you can afford to pay any attention to the feeling? <laughs> Buster, when you put this much money into a ship, you, you, you've passed the point of no return. You've got to make it fly. Mm. Well, I've got a lot to do, Marcus. See you later. Uh, still going to see Courier about your complaint? 
Well, this one is about engine mounts and spars, and you can measure it. About this, I'll see the old man himself, if I have to. I won that fight. I did have to go to the old man, but I won. And then began a succession of battles, some big and some small. I put the plane on trial and I was the prosecution, the devil's advocate, fighting with everything I had to find flaws in the design. I found a lot of small ones, but well, that's really not too unusual. If I hadn't found them, well, somebody else would have. That's why a plane is so many weeks in testing before it finally comes up for approval. Last week, I thought I found something wrong with one of the landing gear jacks. So they took the seven out on the new strip and taxied a set of tires off it. And they didn't find anything. The next day, Humboldt sent for me. Uh, sit down, Mr. Bolton. Thank you, sir. It's uh, Mike, isn't it? Yes, sir, that's right. Well, you'll have to pardon me. It's been some weeks since I've seen you. I've got some uh, reports here on you, Mike, and most of them are pretty good. They lead me to believe that you're one of the bright young men in the organization. There's some valuable contributions you made. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that, sir. But then I didn't call you in to scratch your back. No, sir. <laughs> I didn't think you had. I'm supposed to do quite the opposite. I kind of thought that might be the case, sir. But I really thought that landing gear... I know, I know. Mike, uh, you've been with the company for a long time now. Long enough to know that it costs us a lot of money when we run behind on a delivery date. Yes, sir. Insurance, penalties, and so forth. And the seven cost us about uh, $30,000 a day. Oh, I didn't know that, sir. Well, how does the old joke run? After a while, it begins to mount up. Something like that? Well... I'm not going to boil you out for being wrong about the landing gear. If you'd been right, it would have saved the company a lot of money. But if you don't mind, I, I would like to ask you a question. Anything, sir. All right. Just what is it you don't like about my airplane? I, uh, I don't know, sir. Now, look, I was an engineer once. Do you think there's something, well, some great structural fault, maybe like the wiring problem one of our competitors had a few years back? Or like the metal fatigue business with a comet? Well, it's not that, sir. You said you were an engineer. Then I think you can understand this, sir. Have you ever known a piece of machinery that you just didn't like, didn't trust, for no apparent reason? Many times. I remember I wouldn't trust the Liberty engine when it first came out. I never knew why, but I felt that way. Turned out to be right. I know what you mean. You know there's something wrong, but you just can't tell what. Yes, sir, that's it. Well, that's the way I feel about your plan, and I'm sorry. I've been over a hundred times looking for what it is that bothers me. I can't find it. Hmm. Uh, Mike... One of the co-designers, Mr. Courier, tells me that there's a, well, call it a personality clash, which might account for your feelings. Well, uh, I don't get along too well with Mr. Packard, sir, but well, I, I don't think that's it. Well, Mike, tomorrow we have our first test in the air. Before then, I wish you'd make a point of ending your feud with Mr. Packard. It'll be a big day for him, and he's worked hard. I wouldn't want anything to spoil it. Yes, sir. Just uh, wish him luck or something, all right? I'll do that. And uh, please, Mike, for your own good, don't find any Indians unless we can shoot them. I looked for Packard in the shop. He wasn't there. I finally found him out in the field. They were running some final ground tests on the 7. I walked up behind him, but for a long time I didn't say anything. I just looked at the plane. Wings too long, engines too powerful, landing gear heavy enough to crush a light tank. 
better than 500,000 pounds gross takeoff weight, and it would fly. At least the rules said it would. I told myself I was wrong, that there was never a more airworthy ship built. But I didn't believe it. I tried, but I couldn't believe it. Expecting something to fall off? Oh, hello. I suppose you heard, tomorrow's the day. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, could have come a little sooner except for that landing gear business. I, uh, I wanted to say something about that. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm glad I was wrong, if that's any help. <laughs> I wish I believed you, Bolton. Well, I didn't come down here to argue. Oh? What did you come down for? To wish you luck. Hmm? Oh. Well, thanks. Of course, I suppose I'll be going along for the final check, but I, uh... Well, I just wanted to clear up the hard feelings before I went home for the day. Okay? Fine, Bolton. Thank you. Well, well, I'd better be going along if I'm going to miss being caught in the traffic. <laughs> Good night. Wait. Yes? I just wanted to ask, have your feelings changed any? I mean, about the seven. I wish I could say they have, but I can't. I'm afraid I still feel the same. tested this morning. And the plane's been through every ground test imaginable. I, I, I told you that. Nothing's happened yet. But you think something's wrong with it? Well, well, yes. And today you're going to be in it. Well, I have to be in it, honey. I'm one of the few people who understand it. Well, suppose something happens. Now, nothing's gonna happen. But suppose something does. Now, Anne, uh, I've had this feeling before, and I've been wrong as often as I've been right. Have you, Mike? Well, sure, sure I have. Besides, it won't do any good to talk about it. I've been wrong before, and I'm probably wrong again. Look at... Well, look at the Starfighter. One of the greatest airplanes ever built. <laughs> and it looked like it never could get off the ground. Well, I... I'd better fix you some breakfast. Mm, I'm, I'm pretty full of coffee. I think I'll just wait, wait on breakfast till I come home. It'll be about ten. Okay? Okay, Mike. Now, don't look so sad, honey. I'll be all right. Can you promise me that, Mike? Uh-huh. Well, I, uh, I'd better change. Steady on a course of 215. 215 coming up. Well, Bolton, you kind of surprised me. I did? I thought you'd resort to some dramatics, like collapsing the gear on the ground or something. Oh, like no highway. Oh, I think I'd think of something more original. How does she handle? She's fine. Handles like a dream. What kind of a dream? Not my kind. She won't trim up. Well, that's a minor problem. Take us half a day. Oh, I hope so. Mm. Looks like a little weather ahead. Cumulus, huh? That's the kind of cloud formation that separates the airplanes from the Coke bottles. She'll do fine. I hope so. But I think we're beginning to feel effects now. Feel the buffeting? Well, that's ridiculous. She's, she's getting nose heavy. Yeah, you're losing altitude. Pour on the coal. I think we'd, we'd better turn back. Keep going. She, she's not responding very well. Just keep your heading. I'll worry about that. No, I'll worry about it. Go on, turn this thing around. I'll take the responsibility. This will cost you your job. You're going too far. Well, I'll just have to do that. You won't have to worry about your job, Bolton. There is something wrong. I've just come back from a pretty thorough inspection. To Humboldt, I didn't know you were aboard. Hey, look, if it's, uh, if it's a matter of trim... The seven is too big. She covers too much air, too many currents. Her interior structure can't keep up with the changes in atmospheric pressure. I'm sorry, Packard, but there's just too much metal. The same problem that took the ridgibles out of the air. Yeah. <laughs> no, I never thought of that. And look below on the sea. Hey, there's a line of boats. Coast Guard. I asked them to stand by. You asked them to stand by, sir? Yes, I had the same feeling you did, Mike. 
That's why I came along. Maybe if you hadn't come to me, I wouldn't have paid any attention to the feeling. Uh, by the way, I suppose you knew that uh, for a while you were pretty close to losing your job. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, put about, Captain. I'm going home. Yes, sir. I was just thinking about somebody else who reasoned the way you do, Mike. Davy Crockett. <laughs> Davy Crockett, sir? Sure. Wasn't he the man who said, uh, this rule I leave for others when I'm dead. First be sure you're right, then go ahead. But all I had was a feeling, sir. Well, what's the difference? If you had faith enough in it to back it up, This is Dan O'Hurley again. Have you ever wondered what it is that holds a certain group of people together in a common cause? The group may be a football team, a sales force. The group may be a football team, a sales force, or a circus troupe. And the common cause may be fame, wealth, security, or any combination of the three. But it's not the cause itself that makes them a unit, because all sorts of people want these things. Yet few ever successfully pool their talents with others to achieve them. So, what is the magic ingredient that unifies a group? Well, I have a feeling that it may be summed up as understanding. Understanding by every member of the group of the other fellow's talents and limitations, as well as his own. Sounds very simple, doesn't it? And yet, in one of the most important of all groups, the family, understanding is sometimes very hard to achieve. It's not so surprising when you consider the remarkable variety of its members. Brothers, sisters, the old, the young, all of varying intelligence and ability. Within a family, the need for understanding is greater, perhaps, than, than anywhere else. But it has to start with love, with wanting to understand. The love of our family, the nearest and dearest of our fellow creatures, starts with love of the one who created them, and us, our Almighty Father. When we pray to him as a family, that love is reflected back into our midst and shared by each of us in greater measure than we can ever guess. Try it and see. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Design Flaw, starring Tom Drake. Dan O'Herlihy was your host. Others in our cast were Jason Johnson, Alice Backus, Robert Emlin, and Ted DeCorsia. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present... Shot in the Dark. Starring Bobby Driscoll, Victor Jory will be your host. Join us, won't you? <music> Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.